Welcome to Dissecting Creativity, a program sponsored by the International Center for Studies in Creativity, the purpose of which is to get up close and personal to scholars in the field of creativity, to explore their theories and models, but even more to explore why they have such an interest in creativity and, if they wish, to reveal some things about their own creativity. In this evening's program, we have the great honor of working with Dr. James Kaufman, professor at University of Connecticut, uh, well-established author in the field of creativity, has led several journals in the field of creativity, still serves as an editor for at least two journals in the field of creativity. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. James Kaufman to Dissecting Creativity. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here. So James, we start off each of these interviews by looking at family, family history, uh, where you were born, and uh, how that might have, as we know in the field of creativity, yes. how developmental events uh, often impact adult creativity. So can you tell us about where you were born, childhood, and Absolutely. And um, I was born in Great Neck, New York for about a month, and then we moved to Georgia where Actually, Paul Torrance brought out my dad as a professor. My folks both developed IQ tests, and so I kind of grew up with psychology. And we moved around a lot from Georgia to Chicago to San Diego to Alabama to San Diego again. And certainly that led me to, well, certainly a very different view of what academia was like. Mm -hmm. I assumed that every academic just moved every three years. Yeah. Um, my sister is also a psychologist. She's a professor of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. And my brother um, at one point had been an actor and a writer and more of his creative side. But he, um, even, even today, I often send my parents first drafts of papers and things to get their opinions, even as I often write against IQ tests mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So the study in creativity, we were talking yesterday, is still a niche area within psychology, yes. um, sort of on the periphery, if you will, uh, compared to other, other topics. What, what, what created for you, what facilitated for you an interest in, in creativity? I always wanted to be a creative writer. So I was a journalist when I was in high school and worked as a stringer for the local paper covering the lesser sports like water polo and stuff and wrote fiction, wrote poetry. That was my dream. Went to college, declared my major as creative writing, got to work with a fairly well-known novelist named T. Caragason Boyle, who has done a lot of novels and kind of eccentric characters. And at the last minute, put psychology as a double major, just in case. Okay, okay. And had the very good fortune to meet John Horn, who is a psychology professor there, who is one of the people behind the crystallized fluid idea of intelligence. And I began working with him, and, but still on the, on the side, always wanted to do creative writing. My junior year, I wrote away to 11 different MFA programs. And one of them wrote back saying, every year we graduate 20 M MFAs, and there are 25 jobs in the entire country for people mm. with MFAs, if you can do anything else but this, do that. <laughs> and I thought, and I thought, I can do something else. Okay. I, 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 I could do that. And I decided to do psychology because it was there. And I applied scattershot to graduate schools, social, clinical, experimental, developmental, uh, experimental psychopathology, developmental, cognitive, all around the map, got into four, and ended up studying with Bob Sternberg because it seemed like a kind of cool opportunity. It was interesting because growing up, Sternberg had always been very anti-IQ testing and very yep. anti my parents. <laughs> and I, I grew up with him as the, the cartoon villain in, in the household. <laughs> so I ended up working with Bob Sternberg. But even at that point, nothing to do with creativity. Mm -hmm. Was planning on doing intelligence because that was the only thing I knew anything about. Mm -hmm. And I worked on a master's thesis that I hated beyond all measure. It was on Vygotsky's zone of Those are not my students who are chuckling. I heard a few chuckles with that master's thesis hating. <laughs> you know the quality of it when on page three, my advisor writes, 
this is not what we discussed. <laughs> and then on page four, X's it out. And he X'd out the next 10 pages. Um, even after he wrote, I'm stopping reading, he, he kept <laughs> Xing it out. And I was debating dropping out of grad school. At this time, I was writing plays, and I saw myself as a playwright. And I decided not to because I just couldn't deal with being a waiter. <laughs> I am clumsy. And at some point at the end of my second year, I realized the one thing I cared about was creative writing. And I thought, I could do a master's study on creative writing. Because we had to do two masters. So the first one was a terrible experimental one. The second one was a, a review paper on creative writing. And that ended up becoming my first um, accepted paper. And I spent one summer kind of locked in my parents' basement with the printed out Microsoft Word hard copies of the 99 Cambridge of uh, Handbook of Creativity, and five other books. Hmm. Um, Creative Cognition, Chicks and the High's Creativity, Dean Simonton's Greatness, and Amable's um, 96 book, along with a couple of others I didn't like. <laughs> and I read them, and I thought, this doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's high praise coming from an academic, yeah. It was the first academic books that I read that I didn't hate. Wow. And I decided, OK, I'll do this. Interesting. That's, a, that's, that's fascinating. Now, because we had a conversation yesterday, I can reveal to our audience here and those who are going to watch this um, on the internet that, in fact, you just found out recently that you were successful as a playwright and that you will have a production of a play, musical, that you wrote that will be performed in September. Is that right? Yes. It's, um, so I, I wrote plays all throughout grad school. And one of the ones that I worked on was a musical called Discovering Magento. And it was about a mental health worker and a patient. And it uses a trivia I learned from sensation and perception about how we perceive color. We don't see the color magenta. We just have the red and blue cones firing simultaneously. And we are tricked into seeing it kind of like happiness. It's musical theater. <laughs> and um, so me and my composer kept working on that. And then this past year, he submitted it to the Thespis Festival in New York City, which I'd never heard of. And it, it is playing in New York City, technically off Broadway, for three performances. And hopefully for many others, if other people like it and decide to do it in local regional theaters. Um, DiscoveringMagenta.com, <laughs> which my niece nicely created for us. And I've been revising it, and it's been very surreal. Mm -hmm. um, my friend Ron Bigetto, who I collaborate with mm -hmm. a lot, said, wow, this must be an amazing experience. You can reflect on being creative and analyze it. And no. Um, I, I, when I write creatively, I very much am in the um, don't think about it, don't talk about it. If it's not working, you know, don't try to verbalize it. So basically, everything I've learned about creativity does not help me in the slightest. And I'm a total <laughs> and utter hypocrite. Um, but this is the first time I've really gone back to writing in about 15 years. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's fantastic. It, so it, it intrigues me as someone who respects your, your academic work and writing and the theories and models to know that you are actively pursuing this, this creative side. Um, so I, I, I had shared with you a, a number of questions in advance. And given the theme mm -hmm. for the conversation this evening around creative education, I'm actually going to jump to <laughs> more of your recent work around creativity in schools. And there are some debate going on now, uh, some debate in, in uh, the, the world of education about the Common Core and the impact of the Common Core. And is that something that you know, can creativity coexist with the Common Core? Can you talk about some of your recent thinking and writing? Ab absolutely. Um, a lot of this is with Ron Bigetto, as well as with John Baer. We just did a book called Something Creativity in the Common Core. Um, probably a word like nurturing or improving or <laughs> one of those happy words. But a lot of it is the idea that creativity can coexist in the Common Core. 
and that there's actually a lot of freedom built within the Common Core to allow creativity. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of the rules are about show signs of engagement, show signs of thinking. Well, creativity is a sign of engagement. Creativity is a sign of thinking. And that a lot of our ideas and theories are just kind of slight modifications. You know, stuff as simple as instead of what is the solution, how many different solutions can you do? And, and mm -hmm. very slight, very basic, but allowing students to express themselves creatively while still learning the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and it harkens back to a lot of this stuff that Ron and I often talk about, which is that creativity is still rooted in domain knowledge and that creativity doesn't come out of nowhere, that creativity comes and grows with expertise. And I mean, when I was an aspiring writer, I would write to all these different writers and ask for advice, and they would always say, read. Read a lot. Read everything you can. And it's the same kind of advice for creativity. If you want to do something creative, learn that field. Do it a lot. Fail mm. a lot, usually. Mm. Mm. So let me put you in a position of power, just using imagination here and the hypothetical. If you were um, put in the position of being the czar of education, what, what would you do with that power? What would you like to see? You were talking a little bit about what teachers can do relative to how they engage students, but thinking more... Beyond increasing my salary. Well, that, yeah, you're, you've got the power, so, okay, increasing your salary, number one. Um, it's a great question. Certainly, I feel that the weakness of creativity as a field is its measurement. Mm -hmm. The reason why IQ tests, SAT tests, personality tests, that matter, have so much impact and power is because we accept the tests. Mm -hmm. And that whether or not you agree with what IQ tests measure, nobody argues that they exist and that everybody gets them. Every, every, mm -hmm. everybody you know, every child is given an IQ test. Every student has to take the SAT or the GREs or the ACTs. And until there is a creativity test that can be standardized, administered the same way IQ tests are mm -hmm. or standardized tests are, then whenever there is teaching to the test and we're not going to get out of that, mm -hmm. creativity is always going to get pushed aside. We live in a world where we want tests, we want easy solutions. As much as we say we don't like the SATs, colleges tend to use it because it's there, it's mm. easy. Mm. And it's easy to say, oh, they should look at creativity, but how? Mm -hmm. And I would love to see a major test company, whether it's Pearson or ETS, tackle creativity. And they'll say they have, but to actually care about it and want to succeed, mm -hmm. to put money behind it. And granted, this is why I'd have to be czar, because I'd have to endow <laughs> this, because they won't get that money back. Um, I understand why they don't. Business is business, and there is no clamoring for a creativity test the way there is for IQ testing or SATs or personality tests in the workplace. But to have, I mean, everybody here has an idea of, wow, my IQ is blank, whatever it is. Or personality-wise, I am an INFTJPQ or whatever, even though <laughs> I won't go into that. If every person had that same type of gut, oh, I'm a this type of creative person, or mm. I'm this level, or relating to another big topic I've been looking at, metacognition, I am good at, these are my creative strengths. This is my pattern. The same way for an IQ test, you look at a pattern of these are somebody's intellectual strengths and these profiles mean this and these profiles mean that to have somebody have an idea of what their creative profile would be. Mm -hmm. um, once that exists, then we won't have to keep justifying creativity. Yeah. Well, building on what you just mentioned in terms of profiles, I know <laughs> there's a classic distinction in the field of creativity, big C, little c creativity. Those can be thought of as two different creativity profiles, the eminent creator and then everyday creativity. But you've expanded on that. Um, so can you talk about that work, how you've expanded Absolutely. that? Again, with Ron Baghetto, we this all began, I met Ron at a conference in San Diego 
and we hit it off. We talked on the phone a bit, and then he kind of invited me up to Eugene, and I flew out there, and we spent like seven hours just talking until three in the morning, and we, and we, we ended up sketching out all of Mini C, which was this idea that little c creativity isn't enough, and that currently the main ways that people would look at it was big C, which was genius, you know, eminent, Einstein, Mozart, and then little c, which in essence was everything else. And the problem is that the top composers who weren't quite Mozart were getting shunted in the same category as truly everyday composers, like people who maybe are writing music that people enjoy listening to but may not be up here, next to kids who are trying to write music. And that everybody was kind of getting screwed except for the big C folks. And they were dead, so. <laughs> So we started with Mini C, which is, is, is personal creativity. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to meet the traditional new and appropriate definitions. It can be something that is new to you, even if the world knows about it. It can be task appropriate in your vision, even if other people might not agree. To which we then added, little, you know, went in with, with little C, and then we added Pro C, which is kind of expert level creativity. And when I was growing up, I, I loved Am Amadeus, and I always identified with Salieri, not Amadeus, as, mm -hmm. as the one who, who is creative enough and smart enough to know that he's good but not great. Mm. And Amadeus has big C, Salieri just gets lost in the mix, and pro C was this idea of the person who's accomplished something, who, who's mm. done something that matters, and we don't know mm. if they'll last forever, who knows. Um, I mean, even right now, among who's alive, who's going to be remembered 100 years from now? I mean, we can guess, but we don't know. I mean, probably Bill Gates, probably Paul McCartney, probably Oprah, probably Spielberg, but who knows if movies go out of fashion. So we've taken this work as kind of the, the, the bedrock for a lot of other stuff that we've been working on. So we're working on how to improve giving feedback to help people from no C to mini C or mini C to little C. Mm -hmm. And kind of coming up with these different scenarios of the kid who is all original and not at all appropriate, the kid who's all appropriate, not at all original, and we're still writing that up. Um, the idea of this, the different facets, the different paths. And I've always been very interested in creative domains and laying that alongside the four C's, where what how does your C aspiration combine with your domain to determine what you should do? You mm -hmm. know, so if, if you really want to be a nuclear physicist, you can't do nuclear physics at a mini C level. You know, nobody is a hobbyist who in their <laughs> spare time they go and they work on this atom they're building in their backyard. <laughs> Whereas many fields you can do that. Mm, and there's some that you can do as a hobby, some you can do as a kid, others that you need 10 years or you need incredible expensive equipment or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So it, it strikes me as you're describing um, what sounds like some ideas that are evolving right now that uh, in terms of the time that we have, it's not possible. You've been so prolific to cover uh, many of the, the, the theories and the research that you've done. Um, so I'm gonna conclude with this question, building off of what you just described, what ideas, I think maybe you just described one now, what ideas are you playing with that excite you? Where do you see your work going? What's the, that uh, maybe it's sort of rough right now, but a concept that's important to you that um, might represent your, your, your next product, your next model, next theory? It's interesting because I'm a bit of a, crossroads, personally, mm -hmm. where I was at the same university for 11 years in California. My goal was to get back to the East Coast, bring my wife closer to Jersey. And, and now that I'm here and I've kind of done that, um, I'm kind of figuring out what I want next, mm -hmm. whether it's um, to do a more layperson -y book, mm -hmm. to go more into testing and assessment, to pursue that, to see can we do computerized assessment of creativity, um, somehow, magically, mm -hmm. without completely killing it and infuriating mm -hmm. everybody in the world. Or um, something totally different. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it, a lot of what I'm going on is this stuff 
that I enjoy mm -hmm. and feeling like I've done enough to feel confident enough to want to see what's fun. Mm. You know, so a lot of the, a, a lot of the theoretical, theoretical development I'm doing with, with, with Ron Baguetto, mm. I find fun. A lot of the cross-cultural stuff and getting to know a lot of these um, folks, you know, folks like Vlad Glavino, Mesich Karwaus, Mecha Karwowski in, in, in Eastern Europe, who are just doing new, exciting stuff, new ideas, and getting to collaborate with new people. Mm. Um, the test mm -hmm. development I'm doing with Ronnie Rader Palm and other people, um, and, and of course, still doing way too many books <laughs> because uh, I, I have a real hatred of trees, uh, <laughs> and uh, continuing to do so many that I lose track of. <laughs> well, I hope you will continue to to write because. I am a big fan of, of your work and the contributions that you have made. Thank I'm excited you. about, um, you say you're at a crossroads. It's interesting to me um, knowing Torrance's work and Amabile's work in terms of that intrinsic motivation and, and reflecting on what you find uh, really grabs you. Um, so I wish you well and, Thank you. and thanks for your contributions to, to the field of creativity and the best of luck as you continue forward, James. Thank you so much. So that brings this edition of Dissecting Creativity to a conclusion. We hope that you will join us for other editions in the future. Thank you.